Maui here at the Maui Country Club. Today is August the 28th. We're going to feature a program called Build Up or Build Out, and we've brought one of the national experts to address this, Mr. Randall O'Toole, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. You know, I just m got some calls this weekend in the, during the time of the averted hurricane from my children on the mainland, all four of them grown, living their careers, and I reflected for a moment and realized they're not living in Lahaina and they're not living in Honolulu because they can't afford a mortgage. They're smart kids. They're going to have high income, but they're making their futures off in the distant mainland. How about you? How many of you have children or relatives or others who've left Hawaii as part of the brain drain, one of the biggest problems we have? Well, we experience the high cost of living in so many ways in this state that it has become just part of the price of paradise, if you would, in, in many ways. But here at the Grassroot Institute and with all of you who are gathering together with us today, we're trying to change that. You know, one of the biggest reasons we have a high cost of living in the islands is because of the most valuable commodity, which is land. Frankly, if you've been following some of our research, we've shown that there is more than enough land in the entire Hawaiian Islands to build up or out in a way that is pono and proper, or a way that is smart and that will satisfy the housing needs of the entire population. The problem is, Something that goes back to basic economics. I remember when I took my first freshman economics course at Northwestern University so many, many years ago, decades actually, I have to confess. The first rule we learned was the law of supply and demand. And that pretty much tells us what goes on. Uh, maybe those of you who've been with us for a while recall that two months ago we brought David Callies, professor at the University of Hawaii, and we had a discussion about supply and demand. Professor Callies pointed out that Hawaii has more land use regulations and laws than any state in the entire nation. And what that has done and it may not be anybody's intention that it do this, but it has kind of created a, an artificial scarcity of land. According to Professor Callies, we develop on less than 5% of all the land mass of the Hawaiian Islands. Less than 5%. More than 95% is zoned for conservation and for agriculture. The irony is that even so, most of that land zone for agriculture is just sitting fallow, and you all know that here since the closing of the cane factory. Well, what's going on if we have all of this land available? We've created an artificial shortage, and this is how. Our land use policies have restricted development to a very narrow zone, and I asked as a, a thought experiment, Professor Callies, what would happen if we took that little over 4% that's being developed right now that has housing on it, that has urbanization, what if we took that and we increased it by one percentage point? We go from 4% to 5%. Well, you'll immediately know that that would increase the supply of land for a building by 20%. Dr. Kelly said, yes, that's absolutely right, but he went a step further. He said that he's already talked to his economists and they say such a development of 1% more from 4 to 5% development would not hurt the aquifer, our very precious source of water in the islands, would not hurt the environment whatsoever. It could be done easily. In fact, he says we could develop up to 10% more. Now, if we went from 4% to, uh, to a 10% figure, which is, I correct myself, is what he meant, we'd be more than doubling the land that is used for urbanization. Let me make one thing clear here. I'm not here today to promote that we do that much development. I just want you to see the stark truth that if we increase development by one percentage point of what we do currently, by, by cleaning up our land use and zoning laws, we'd have a 20% increase in the supply of land. Now, going back to that fundamental economics lesson of law and supply and demand, what happens if the supply increases the exact opposite of what happens when the supply decreases. Supply decreases, demand stays the same, the cost goes through the roof. But if the supply increased and we prevented somehow foreign investment from taking all of that, 
we'd have more than enough land in order to meet the needs of Hawaii's people. Now, I'm starting with that to give context to what we're going to talk about today, because at the Grassroot Institute, we're more concerned about having long-term research based upon rational thinking rather than political positioning. And it may not be politically possible to talk about increasing development. It may not be politically uh, popular, I mean, to talk about increasing development. So we're staying out of that conversation today. We're simply looking at what the data shows. And in order to do that, I've invited a dear friend of the Grassroot Institute, one of our Grassroot Fellows who has contributed to our research base. You can find his writings online, Mr. Randall O'Toole. Randall is also a fellow at the Cato Institute, and he wanted me to make sure you knew that he doesn't always get their blessing. He works for them from time to time because of the excellence of his research, but other times they like him to keep his mouth shut. If, uh, I could give you a long list of credentials about Randall, but what I really want you to know is he's a good friend who shares our heartbeat, who really knows what the issues are here locally and on Maui. If you saw him when he arrived at the airport at Kahului, he went to baggage claim and got a, a bag, and then it unfolded into that bicycle. Do you see that over there? And he drove to his next destination. He goes all over the world with his bicycle. In other words, he leaves a smaller carbon footprint than Al Gore or Bernie Sanders. <laughs> but he's a rabid lover of nature, the environment, and he's a vegetarian. Put that together and wrap that up with the Cato Institute. You've got a platypus that is really like a duck out of water. And that's why I like him, because he knows about Hawaii. You'll discover he knows about Hawaii in his next book coming out, Romance of the Rail. And I don't know if he's gotten copies of this. It isn't out in the stores yet. But Romance of the Rail is a study of rail systems across the world, and it talks about one on a little island called Oahu, for which, by the way, in case you didn't look at your GE tax, you're paying for. And uh, so he knows what our issues are and what the struggles of living on an island are all about. I really love this book by Randall, American Nightmare, How Government Undermines the Dream of Home Ownership, and you can find that available here. Randall is one of the foremost experts on transportation and land use. You're going to love what he has to say, and I hope you'll ask some questions or make some comments. In order to do that, because we are recording live here, we're going to ask you when he's finished to line up right next to me over here and come to the microphone. But until that time, give your attention and your mind to Mr. Randall. O'Toole. Randall, come on up. Thank you very much. I'm always happy to come here and uh, bicycle around and speak to the Grassroot Institute. Uh, I love the Grassroot Institute because Cato has never told me not to keep my mouth shut. They've just said, if you're going to say that, don't say it in our name. Uh, that's very uh, liberal of them. Uh, but when they say that, then I have to figure out, well, whose name am I going to say it in? And it turns out the Grassroot Institute is often the answer. Uh, so if you see something by me published by the Grassroot Institute, it's probably because the Cato Institute didn't like it. Uh, I don't know if that's an endorsement or, or not. But whoops, let me get here at the beginning. I want to start out by introducing you to a town that you've probably never heard of. And in fact, it's the biggest city in America that almost no Americans have ever heard of. It's called Buckeye, Arizona. Anybody heard of it? Couple, three people, all right. Buckeye uh, is 400 square miles. There's only five cities that are bigger than that. Los Angeles, Houston, San Antonio, uh, Oklahoma City, and Phoenix. Uh, there's some city-county consolidations that are bigger, but just cities, there's only five cities bigger than 400 square miles, but it only has 70,000 people. Uh, it is a developer's dream. Basically, it's a city set up to be the next big suburb of Phoenix, and they've divided, subdivided it into tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of building lots, you can buy a house today, brand new, for less than $83 a square foot for that house. This house, it's about 2,700 square feet. Uh, it's about uh, a little less than $250,000. Uh, 
That's a brand new house. You can buy a used house there for $98 a square foot. This house uh, is uh, about 3,000 square feet, and it's about uh, $290,000. Um, probably the median, the median home price for the Phoenix area is $150 a square foot. That's probably higher than Buckeye, but I couldn't get a, a, a median for Buckeye alone. Now, $83, $98, that compares with Maui, which according to Zillow is $519 a square foot, is the median price of housing. That means half the housing is more than that, half is less than that. Yes, you can pay less but you get what you pay for. Maui isn't even the worst. Oahu is $545 a square foot. And we can blame some of this on the Jones Act, which makes it real expensive to bring materials into Hawaii. But the Big Island is $275 a square foot. So that means most of the difference between Buckeye's $100 a square foot and Maui's $500 a square foot, most of the difference is due to something other than the Jones Act. Now, before we look at what that is, I want to talk a little bit more about Buckeye and how they've made it so cheap. Buckeye is the pink area here. And you notice it's got parts that aren't attached to the city that they've annexed. It's got parts that are attached to the city by one, the width of one street. Uh, and then it's got other parts. And Phoenix is on the, the, uh, the right-hand side. Buckeye is on the left. Uh, you can see Buckeye is a pretty significant fraction of the size of Phoenix. Basically, they just annexed everything that wanted to be turned into a master planned community. Master planned communities, if you aren't familiar with them, tend to consist of uh, uh, large chunks of land that have housing, parks, commercial areas, schools. Everything is built into the community so it can be somewhat self-sufficient. And in, in Arizona, they have what are called community facilities districts. Other states call them other names. Texas calls them municipal utility districts. Uh, in the West Coast, we call them special service districts. But if, if you're a developer, you create a, a community facilities district. There's 11 of them in Buckeye right now. These districts sell bonds. They build all the infrastructure, the sewer, the water, the streets, and everything else. And then they sell, and then the developers sell home sites to people, as well as other kinds of development, to commercial developments and so on, to people. And the buyers pay a fee, an annual fee, for 30 years to pay back the bonds. It's like a property tax, but it's a fixed annual fee for 30 years. And that way, the, the cost of these facilities isn't, doesn't have to be paid up front. Like with an impact fee, some communities charge $60,000 or more for impact fees to pay for infrastructure. As an up upfront cost, that increases housing costs because owners of existing housing say, hey, look, new people who are selling new homes have to pay a $60,000 impact fee, so that means we can raise the price of our house by $60,000 and end up uh, making housing that much less affordable for everybody. So Kali'i al already told you uh, half my presentation, what makes land so unaffordable in, in, in Hawaii. And, and the answer is uh, the land use laws. Only some states have passed laws like this. And there are several different kinds of laws, but uh, generically, they're called growth management laws. They're attempts to control where growth takes place and in some cases, how fast growth takes place. In all cases, they end up controlling how fast, but they don't intentionally do so. But you can see the red and yellow states on here are states that have some sort of growth management. The green states don't have growth management. Sometimes uh, urban areas in those green states, such as Denver and Salt Lake City, have written growth management plans, but the states as a whole have not passed growth management laws. And it turns out states that are unaffordable tend to be the states that have passed growth management laws. These are the states, red is very unaffordable, uh, orange and yellow is marginally unaffordable, and green is very affordable. So you can see the states that tend to have the growth management laws, which are the ones on the coast, tend to also be the ones that are unaffordable. 
Hawaii started the trend in 1961. And Hawaii was deliberately imitating Great Britain, whose parliament in 1947 passed a law called the Town and Country Planning Act. And this law said, we're going to confine everybody in Britain to 6% of the land in the country. And you won't be allowed to build a house outside of this land. It was actually uh, a way of uh, uh, preserving the aristocracy in Britain. Because most of the land in Britain is owned by a handful of people. 70% is owned by like one half a percent of all the people in Britain. And they were broke at the end of World War II. And so what the government decided to do is they, they could see that these landowners were going to start selling their land to recover their finances. So what the government decided to do was to pay them $100 an acre a year not to sell their land, not to develop their land, and then forbid in, any development outside of the ur already urban areas. So as a result, housing has become very expensive there because everybody's crammed into these tight areas. So Hawaii wanted the, the same, to do the same thing. Uh, the, the state legislature was concerned about the agricultural industry, uh, and they said, we want to preserve agriculture, and so we're going to confine all development to the areas we decided are urban, which are about 5% of the state. It's less than 5% in Maui, Kauai, and the Big Island, and it's about 10%, maybe 11% of Oahu. Now, what do these laws do? Um, they make land more expensive. They also give government incentives to be more bureaucratic because you can't go anywhere else except for in that areas that are, are allowed to be developed. And so you end up paying more money that way. Somebody in 2002 did a comparison of Dallas, which has no land, virtually no land use laws. Counties in Texas aren't allowed to zone. Dallas has zoning, but it's very liberal zoning and very flexible. And they compared it with San Jose, which uh, uh, drew an urban growth boundary in 1974 and has never expanded it. And it's an uh, extremely expensive place to live. Uh, they found in 2002 that a, a 2,400 square foot lot in San Jose cost $230,000, whereas a 7,000 square foot lot in Dallas cost only $30,000. So right there, we've got $200,000 more expensive in San Jose. Uh, San Jose charges big impact fees. At that time, it was about $30,000. I think it's about double that today. <laughs> Dallas charges a nominal couple thousand dollars in impact fees. Uh, the cost of getting a permit to build in San Jose is extremely high, especially because there's no guarantee you'll ever get the permit. It can take you five years to get a permit to build one house. If you want to build a bunch of houses, you could spend a million dollars and not ever get a permit. So the cost per house built ends up being $100,000 a house, whereas in Dallas it was about $10,000 a house. If you applied for the permit, you pretty much got it. And finally, because housing is more expensive in San Jose, labor costs are higher, so that added $43,000 to the price of the house. Now, all of these numbers are much higher today than they were in 2002, and they're probably roughly uh, proportional uh, in Maui as they are in San Jose, because Maui and San Jose are both are similarly unaffordable. Now, here's a, a, a pie chart showing how much land in Hawaii has been urbanized. It's about 5%. Uh, rural developments is a, another percent, so 94% of Hawaii is uh, rural. Uh, some of it's forest, some of it's government land. About 30% is supposed to be farmland. And when you propose to develop, uh, the Sierra Club and other people will come out of the woodwork and say, oh no, we have to preserve our farmlands. Well, here's what happened to the farmlands. They made it so expensive to live here that farmers can't afford to hire workers. And so just between 1982 and 2012, 30 years, the number of acres devoted to farming declined by 75%. So they had to destroy the agricultural industry to save it, is what it comes down to. So that the idea that they're doing this to preserve farms is just an excuse. They've done far more damage to farms than urban sprawl ever would have done uh, by restricting housing and making housing expensive. 
If you haven't read this book, I urge you to do so. Uh, it was a bestseller in Hawaii when it came out. Uh, it's still all relevant today. Uh, it details the history of, of, of the land use law and how the land use law has made uh, uh, housing unaffordable, but more how it has affected the politics. Uh, the Democrats in 1958 got elected, took over the legislature from Republicans on a promise of land reform because most of the land was owned by a few companies, five companies, and they didn't want to sell their land for housing. So they promised to take away the land and make it available for housing, and instead they enshrined the company policies into law at a time when the companies are starting to think about maybe we should sell our, some of our land for more housing because we can make more money that way than using it for uh, growing sugar cane or pineapple or whatever. Now, when housing becomes expensive, the first thing politicians will do is they'll say, well, we'll solve that with some affordable housing. There's a difference between affordable housing and housing affordability. They sound like the same thing. But affordable housing is a kind of housing that is subsidized to provide decent housing for low-income people. So it's a type of housing. Housing affordability is a measure of housing. It's a measure of what is the general affordability level for everyone in an area, not just low-income people. And housing affordability, uh, apply, since it applies to everyone, building a few units of so-called affordable housing for a few lucky people isn't necessarily going to help everyone else. Plus, government is extraordinarily inefficient when it comes to affordable housing. They will spend twice as much to build homes as the private sector would do, and then rent those homes out or sell them well below what they spent building them, uh, and the taxpayers have to eat the subsidy. Here's an affordable housing complex in Seattle that's costing $530 a square foot, almost as much as Hawaii, considerably more than private builders are spending on building housing in Seattle. Here's one in Portland that's $650 a square foot. They, they gave the developer $27 million in affordable housing funds to build this. And it's affordable because they're going to sell individual units for $250,000, which in Portland is cheap for a house. But the units that they're selling are 660 square feet. That's tiny, OK? Most of you probably live in a 1,200 to 2,000 square foot home. The average home in Portland is close to 2,000 square feet. New homes today are 2,200 square feet. So 660 square feet is tiny. It's Soviet-style living. The Soviet Union built thousands of high-rises like this, thousands of units of housing of high-rises, and they gave like uh, uh, 60 square meters to people in these uh, uh, 60, you know, 60 square meters, which is about 600 square feet for a family of four. So Soviet-style housing, they call it affordable, but it's only because it's so heavily subsidized. The problem is the government can't build enough of it to make a dent in the housing market for everyone else. There's about 350,000 homes in Oahu. There's about 75,000 homes in Maui. How many homes would the government have to build to make housing less expensive for everyone else? They have to build thousands, tens of thousands of units of homes. And when they're talking about spending $650 a square foot, uh, it's, the government can't afford to do it. How do they pay for it when they do do build affordable housing? Usually they pay for it by taxing existing homes. Sometimes they pay for it by taxing new homes. So either way, they're making housing less affordable for everyone else in order to 
provide a few units of afford heavily subsidized affordable housing for a few lucky people. That doesn't solve the problem, it makes it worse. Now, the standard measure of affordability is the median home price divided by the median family income. There's some variations. A friend of mine likes to use median household income because many countries don't keep track of the difference between families and households. Uh, but the C Census Bureau in the United States does have good data on family incomes. Um, so I compare median price versus median family income. Of course, you know, by definition, median means half of all the homes are more than the median price, half or less. Half of all the incomes are more than the median income, half or less. So presumably, there's a good range of homes of all prices, and there's a good range of incomes. So there's a one-to-one a -one match. The low-income people can buy the low-cost homes. The high-income people can buy the high-cost homes. And uh, if the median income is not too much higher, it, if the median home price is not too much higher than the median income, it's affordable. If you want to buy, under current mortgage rules, a house that costs twice your, median, twice your income, you can pay off that house in about eight years with a standard mortgage. If you want to buy a house that costs three times your income, it takes about 15 years. If you want to buy a house that costs four and a half times your income, it takes about 30 years. If it costs more than four times, four and a half times your income, it's really, really hard to get a mortgage on that house. They'll say, you can't afford it, we're not going to give you a mortgage. So, once housing prices get to be, once median prices get to be more than four and a half times median incomes, it means most people in the housing market are not going to be able to get a home. They're not going to be able to buy a home and they're going to have a hard time renting a home because usually rentals, prices are going to be proportional to home uh, buying prices. So, in, in Hawaii, uh, Median home prices are well over six times median family incomes in, in Oahu, Maui, and Kauai. Only in the island of Hawaii are they around five times, which is still a little bit outside of the affordable range, but it's more affordable than uh, the other three islands. <clears throat> when we compare on a state-by-state -state basis, Hawaii has the least affordable housing of any state in the country, followed closely by California. California passed its land use laws shortly after Hawaii. 1963 was the first one. Uh, there were several more, but they all added up to making housing expensive in California. Oregon passed its land use law in 1973. It's not quite as unaffordable. It's a little more flexible. They add, regularly add land to the uh, urbanized base, but in 1980, when they first implemented the law, uh, one and a quarter percent of the state was, was zoned urban. Now it's up to 1.33 percent. So it hasn't been that much of an addition, but it has, the additions have kept housing a little more affordable in Oregon. Texas uh, and Georgia have some of the fastest growing urban areas in the country. Houston grows by uh, the population of Maui about every two or three years. Uh, Dallas grows almost as fast, and Atlanta grows almost as fast. And they're very affordable because they don't have growth management. They don't have these strict laws. Now, using affordable housing funds to try to solve housing affordability problems won't work. So the next thing they propose is to build up. They say, okay, we've got a footprint, we've de dedicated 5% of the land in Hawaii to urban uses, so we're gonna build high-density housing on that 5%. <clears throat> right now, Honolulu uh, is about 5,500 people per square mile. That's twice the density of the average urban area in America. The average urban area is about 2,300 people per square mile. So Honolulu is already really dense, and yet median home prices are 8.2 times median family incomes. Well, how are we going to solve that problem? Are we going to make Honolulu as dense as San Francisco? Now, every time you see an article 
online or in the newspaper about housing prices in San Francisco, they always show you this row of Victorian houses. Always. What they don't show you is right next to that row of Victorian houses is a massive seven-story apartment building because most of San Francisco is already very dense. It has 17,000 people per square mile. That's three times Honolulu. That's uh, about seven times the average density of the average urban area in America. And yet, median home prices there are 8.3 times median family incomes. It's worse than Honolulu. Well, how about New York City? New York City has 27,000 people per square mile. And this, which is far more than Honolulu, it's about five times Honolulu. And yet its value to income ratio is 8.7. It's even less affordable than Honolulu. Um, how about Manhattan? Let's just look at Manhattan. 67,000, 69,000 people per square mile. Uh, their value to income ratio is 10 to 1. It's one of the least affordable places in the United States. San Jose is actually less affordable, but uh, Manhattan is one of the least affordable. How about Hong Kong? Ever been to Hong Kong? The epitome of dense housing. Did you know that 75% of Hong Kong is rural open space? The government won't let people build on it. What a coincidence. Um, 70,000 people per square mile for the entire country of Hong Kong, the urbanized portion of it. Uh, and the valued income ratio is 19 to 1. You have people, of course, getting apartments and subdividing each room of the apartment into little teeny rooms and then renting out those little teeny rooms. So they might have 8 or 10 or 20 people in what was once an apartment for a family of, of two or three or four people. Now, in general, um, the denser you get, the more expensive you get. The vertical axis here is the value to income ratio, and the horizontal axis is density. You can say in, see that in general, you get denser, you get less affordable. Now, why is that? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, if you build low-rise developments, that is two to three-story developments, uh, it's really cheap to build. You can build with wood. You don't need to use a lot of metal. You don't need to use a lot of concrete. When you want to build mid-rise developments, that's four to five stories, you have to have concrete fire barriers between each floor. You have to use a lot of metal for structural support. So it costs about 50% more per square foot. You want to build high-rise, six stories or more, then you're talking about elevator shafts, you're talking about a lot more fire protection, and a lot of other things, the cost of ends up being about 68% more per square foot than for low-rise developments. So mid-rise and high-rise has a, a, a disadvantage right away in that it costs a lot more to build. Plus, especially in cities that have tried to implement growth management, the land costs are really high. Uh, typically, it costs three to five million dollars an acre for land, and that means you have to put in hundreds of housing units to get the cost per housing unit down to what it would be if you were letting people build low density development. Buckeye, for example, you can buy building lots for $24,000. <laughs> So if it costs $2.4 million an acre, they have to build 100 units of housing to get the cost of land per unit less than that. And $2.4 million is probably far less than what uh, costs are in Honolulu, and certainly far less than in uh, San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, and Portland, and so on. Now, Florida passed a growth management law in 1985. And it sent housing prices skyrocketing in the 2000s because every urban area in the state was required to write a plan. They got their plans written by the late 1990s, and prices just started shooting up. So in 2011, the state legislature repealed the law. And immediately, the, the law didn't re repeal the authority to do growth management, but it, it repealed the mandate. So some cities decided to stop doing growth management, and some decided to keep on doing it. 
the cities that started, decided to stop doing growth management, you immediately saw an effect on housing prices. For example, Pasco County is in the suburbs of Tampa, and uh, recent, I, I was just there earlier this month, and uh, I saw this article in the paper. Uh, the, uh, Len is it Lennox? I think it's called Lennox, the nation's largest home builder, bought 2,900 acres from a developer in Pasco County, and they're going to put thousands of homes on them. It cost $8,000 an acre to buy that land. That wouldn't have been possible until, well, it would have been possible for them to buy it, but they wouldn't be able to do anything with it until they repealed the growth management law in 2011. So what, what happened was, under the growth management law, um, <coughs> value to income ratios went way up, and then they collapsed because of the housing crisis. And since then, they've gone up in Miami, because apparently Miami elected to keep on implementing growth management, but in Tampa, Tallahassee, Jacksonville, Gainesville, other cities in Florida, uh, home prices have stayed pretty constant, and value to income ratios have stayed pretty constant, because they're allowing more and more development in the place. Now, it would be nice to think that you could go to your legislature and convince them to repeal Hawaii's land use law, which was passed in 1961, and all the subsequent amendments. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think they're going to do that, not anytime soon. But we have another avenue, and that is the courts. We have a provision in our Constitution that says you can't take private property for public use without just compensation. The problem is the Supreme Court has recently, recently, in the last 50 years, issued a number of rulings that have undermined this constitutional requirement. In 1976, they issued a ruling called Penn, Station versus the or Penn Central versus the State of New York. The issue was Penn Central was losing money on their railroad, and they wanted to build a skyscraper on top of Grand Central Terminal which was built, which was designed to have a skyscraper on top of it, but they just never got around to doing it. Now they thought they could make more money with the skyscraper than they could running trains, and the city, state of, the city of New York said, oh, we think Grand Central is a historic site, so we're not going to let you do it. And they went to court, and the Supreme Court essentially said that the city can do whatever it wants through regulation, and as long as it leaves you a little value to your land, they can take away all the value, all the rest of the value, without any compensation at all. So that opened up the door for Hawaii's land use laws and Oregon's land use laws and California's land use laws. And then, of course, I'm sure you've heard of the Kelo decision, which was uh, in Connecticut. Uh, that was a slightly different decision. This, the city wanted to take uh, this neighborhood by eminent domain. They wanted to pay compensation. But the purpose of taking it was to uh, give it to a developer who would build fancier homes, and they'd be able to collect higher taxes from it. As you may know, what happened instead was they took the land, and the developer said, I changed my mind. I don't want to build those homes. And so now their land has been turned into a dump. But the Supreme Court ignored that possibility and said, oh, you're going to get more taxes from it? OK, that's great. Uh, besides, you wrote an economic development plan. Notice both the Penn Central decision and the Kelo decision depended on the fact that the city had written an urban plan. So now every city in America has urban planners so that they can write plans and get around the Fifth Amendment. So I don't think, oh, that's, that's Suzette Kelo's house today. So right now, the Supreme Court interpretation of the Constitution is that you can take land through regulation as long as you leave a little bit of the value left without compensation, or you can take all the value with compensation and give it to a private developer uh, if you can find one. Now, there's a chance that a new Supreme Court could overturn those rulings. We don't know if this guy is going to get confirmed to the Supreme Court. We don't really know what kind of decisions he's going to make, but he's replacing the kilo as a five to four decision. and uh, He's replacing one of the five who voted to support the Kelo decision. 
So if he supports property rights, we might be able to get the Supreme Court to overturn uh, 60 years of land use law in, in Hawaii, California, Oregon, and Washington. But I'm a little dubious of that. We might not be able to do that. We do have another alternative. Um, in 2015, the Supreme Court came up with a decision that said that uh, if you take away, if you make housing more expensive through your land use decisions, and that makes it harder for low-income minorities to live in your area, then uh, you're effectively putting up a sign saying, no minorities allowed. And that violates the, the Fair Housing Act. They specifically targeted land use ordinances and rules and policies. And it's true, uh, the number of native Hawaiians living on Oahu is declining because they can't afford to live there. The number of blacks living in San Francisco is declining because they can't afford to live there. The number of blacks living in Los Angeles is declining because they can't afford to live there. And so these laws are impacting uh, low income minorities. So without bringing up property rights, we still might be able to overturn these laws using the disparate impact ruling. What I'm worried about is that we might end up, if Brett Kavanaugh gets appointed to the Supreme Court, with the Supreme Court conservative enough to overturn the disparate impact ruling, but not conservative enough to overturn the property rights rulings. That would be my nightmare. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope somebody's willing to bring these cases to a court for a test. Um, Kali'i already mentioned my book, American Nightmare. I do have a few copies with me. Uh, Cato sells them for $25. Uh, you can buy them online, uh, electronic EPUB version or Kindle version for, I think, $13. Uh, if you want my autograph, though, I hope you'll buy one today so I don't have to carry them back on my bicycle. I'm selling them for $20. And I, he also mentioned my new book, Romance of the Rails. I've got an examination copy here. If you're intrigued by the Honolulu rail line, or if you've ridden Amtrak, or you've ridden the Shinkansen in, in Japan, or the TGV in, in France, and want to know why we don't have those things in the United States, uh, Romance of the Rails will answer those questions for you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Let's give Randall O'Toole a very big hand. Great job, great presentation. And I hope you will come up and meet him afterward. I'm letting him drink a little bit of water now. As those of you who'd like to ask some questions, come on up to the front so that we can actually hear you and record you. Form a line immediately to my left over here. But uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. As they're coming up to the microphone, you notice you have a white card. Would love for you to give your feedback to us on that white card. And in particular, uh, if you don't have one, just raise your hand and wave. We'll get one to you. I see a few places where we don't have them. In particular, let us know what you think about researching further in this area. Tell us what you think about a potential research project at the Grassroot Institute to identify those particular land use regulations which need to be repealed. Would you be interested in seeing a research project that did that and that went forward? Just give us your thoughts on that. Okay, Randall, your break is up. <laughs> You'll join us back over here. <laughs> Rob, come on up and go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Very much enjoyed your presentation. Excellent. There's a columnist by the name of Mark Stein who has brought up the housing issue nationally. And he maintains that there are far more houses in America than there are families. Why are we not seeing a shift in the population toward places where there are houses but no one living in them? Great question, Randall. Well, first of all, there are about 12% of the housing stock in America is vacant, meaning it's second homes, pretty much. And people own second homes and they're happy to have two homes. It's, it's not unusual. Uh, in Europe, a lot of people live in a, a multifamily apartment, but then they have a second home that's a single family home that's up in the mountains that they go visit in the summers. So second homes are typical. Uh, the issue is not why people aren't moving to where their homes are vacant. The issue is whether people are moving to where homes are cheap because home builders are able to build and meet the demand. Uh, in Houston, for example, 
you can get a permit to build a house, you can buy land, get a permit, have the house built, and move in within 120 days from when you bought, when you bought the land. In California, it can take you five years or more. So we are seeing a movement. People are moving out of California, and they're moving to Texas. Um, Texas population is growing rapidly. If it weren't for immigration from other countries, probably California's population would be shrinking. Thank you. Yes, sir. Chuck, come on up here. Question? Here's your question. Here's the microphone. So yeah, I'm Chuck Thorne from HANA. Um, one of the uh, things the government's been doing recently to alleviate the housing problem is to limit how many short-term rentals people can have, how many bed and breakfast. They think somehow that, I think we're allowed 35 in HANA, and they think that how, with that, then people will make their houses available for long-term rentals. It doesn't seem like it's working, and to me it seems like it's taking away our rights to do what we want with our own property. So do you think that's a good idea? What do you feel about that? Thank you. I think you're exactly right. They've taken away the rights for people to build homes where they want to, on land they own where they want to build them, and then in, they make scapegoats of uh, the short-term rental market and say they're the problem, but the problem isn't that. If uh, home builders are allowed to build, they will build enough homes to provide first homes, second homes, short-term rentals, all the housing we need. It's the government that's preventing housing home builders from doing that, and that's the problem. Thank you very much. And yes, tell us your name. Sylvia Caporello. Here's Sylvia. Come on up here, Sylvia. Well, I can talk about affordable housing all day. Um, Only have a couple of minutes. Couple of minutes huh? <laughs> The biggest problem I find is the HUD factor for Maui. We have affordable homes, but very expensive. A and B was uh, so grateful to give um, Monsanto land, 50 years poison, for our affordable homes. And they were priced at that time equal to houses in our very highest expensive district and they were called affordable. 20 people qualified out of 200. For the next project, five people qualified out of 50. So then we have this HUD factor, which I would been asking Joe to try to work on, where if the people can't afford them, they go to public. They go out to public. So any tourist that gets off a plane can buy these homes. And I know our children, my daughters have worked since they were 14, got their degrees, working full time, making 40,000 a year. And the median price is in the 60s. That is not a correct median price for Maui. You wanna go ahead and ask the question? Why don't you go ahead and ask I'll Randall a question? Get rid of HUD. <laughs> <laughs> Before Randall answers, I, I do hope you'll go to our website and take a look at a research report that Randall wrote for the Grassroot Institute on disparate impact. Just put those words into the search in engine. Well, I have to say that the Trump administration is doing a lot of things that I don't agree with, but their management of HUD and the Department of Transportation are far superior to anything we've seen in many decades. Uh, it would be nice to get rid of HUD, it would be nice to get rid of the Federal Department of Transportation, but in the meantime, they're at least doing some good things, and, and HUD is backing off on a lot of the uh, bad rules that have been passed during the Obama administration. Uh, one rule was called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing that was mandating uh, that cities put in high density developments and things like that. <coughs> the problem is that people think that affordable housing programs will solve housing affordability problems. They won't. As you point out, they spend as much on these homes as the cost of build, uh, private builders spend on luxury homes. And then they limit the number of people who can get them because they're so expensive, they can only build a few of them. In San Francisco, to be eligible for an affordable home, 
you have to have an income of less than $117,000 a year because San Francisco is so unaffordable that anybody with an income of less than $117,000 a year can't afford a house there. Well, of course, there are a lot of people who earn less than $117,000 a year, and the government is never going to be able to build homes for all of them. So it's just going to be a lucky few who get those homes. And they often come with strings attached that make the housing uh, very undesirable. Uh, for example, if, if you buy an affordable home from the government, you're not allowed to resell it for market value. You can only sell it for what you paid for it, plus a small inflation factor. So you don't get to take advantage of the, uh, the bank that people get when they buy a home. You know, they can sell their home or borrow against it or things like that. You can't do that if you've got an, uh, an affordable home. And finally, um, I stay at Airbnb a lot. And there's a lot of times I'll stay at an Airbnb and I'll look around and say, this is low-income housing. Somebody's renting this by claiming that they are low-income, and then they're subletting it to people like me who are paying them $50 or $100 a night to stay there. And the people who are renting it aren't there. You never see the actual landlord uh, who is, sub is leasing it or renting it from the housing authority. That's illegal. Uh, that kind of Airbnb, I think, should be stopped. But uh, don't think that HUD or affordable housing is going to solve housing affordability. Thank you, Randall. One last question we have over here. Joe Kent, our Vice President for Research. Joe? Thanks, Randall. I, I hear a lot that if there was a, um, a housing crash on the mainland, um, you know, like a stock market crash, that it wouldn't affect us out here because, um, you know, everybody wants a home in Hawaii. So uh, are we um, at danger of uh, being affected by that on the mainland? Or? Thank you, Joe. Well, what were housing prices like here in 2009 versus 2006? A lot lower, right? One of the things that happens when you start limiting land supply is you not only make housing more expensive, you make it extremely sensitive to changes in demand. If there's a small increase in demand, it's really hard to fulfill that. Home builders might try, want to fulfill it, but they have a hard time, and so prices go way up. Similarly, if there's a small decrease in demand, prices will crash. And so you make housing not just more expensive, you make housing prices more volatile. And that makes home ownership more risky because you're never sure when you're going to have to sell your home. So you might end up buying at the top of the market and selling at the bottom of the market, and your house is, as they say, underwater. Uh, and that's something that's only been a serious problem since the states have gotten into growth management. Housing never used to fluctuate like that, and it doesn't fluctuate like that in places like Houston and San Antonio uh, that don't have growth management laws. Thank you very much. Let's have another hand for Randall O'Toole. D don't forget, please. Uh, yes, your cards. Oh, we have one question. We'll fit it in really quickly here with Ms. Luzier. Randall, come on back up. You're still working. Maybe you can help me with the details on this. I understand there's a um, amendment. Let's see. How am I saying this? Uh, an amendment that's going to be on by the legislature on the ballot, general education, uh, general election ballot, that that is uh, going to, uh, you can help me, authorize the, uh, yes, of the, well, how is, what's your response to the surcharge being, um, uh, legislature going to authorize themselves to determine property values and they're going to add a surcharge tax upon our uh, investment properties. A question about what is the definition of investment property student. Are you aware of that? Your what response? Is to go for? Education. R Randall, I, let me just ask you in a general sense. I think that our audience is very familiar with the upcoming ballot measure on the, uh, for the Hawaii elections, which would tag 3% onto property taxes 
in order to pay for the Department of Education expenses. Although the measure doesn't specify education, that politically is what it's intended for. I know you don't, you don't look at this specifically, but if you have some general thoughts on raising property taxes in order to fund education in Hawaii, you may want to share those, if you care. Well, my only general thought is that Hawaii is the most expensive state to live in in the country. A lot of that is Hawaii's own fault. Part of it's the Jones Act, but a lot of it is the fault of land use and other policies uh, made by the state of Hawaii. The high cost of living here makes, expense, makes education really expensive. It makes hiring teachers expensive, hiring administrators expensive. And so uh, you're in kind of a death spiral of, okay, we'll raise taxes. Well, that will make the cost of living higher, so that'll I mean, we'll have to pay people more, so then we'll have to raise taxes again, and uh, that's not the solution that you really want to get into. Thank you. If you'll stay up here, we'll close in just a moment. And you caught us live, actually, Susan, with that question. Research is taking place this very minute at the Grassroot Institute asking a very simple question, and we will release this answer within the next week or two. And that is, if the measure goes through with the, cons with the uh, ballot um, amendment to increase property taxes by 3%, how much will that cost you? We're being told that it will raise $500 million for education, but how much will it cost you in your taxes? If you'd like to know, we'll be releasing that figure within the next 10 days. And to make sure that you get it, make sure you fill out one of the white cards with your address and your information. Did you enjoy being here today at Grassroot Institute? Thank you very much. Please come up and meet Randall O'Toole and get one of his books.